this morning. My name is Justin Smith. I'm the founder and curator of Apple Visualism. And I'm going to be giving a lecture today about Apple Visualism, my practice, and my concept of design as a continuum. So, Apple Visualism is my brand platform and practice on the, on the study and intersection of black visual culture, popular culture, and sonic slash musical culture. And this idea of the design is continuum. You can see with my logo my shirt up here that I have these dots, and these dots are the connecting points and the constellations and the conversations that make up what this practice is. And this idea of visualism is the idea of something being visual and forming mental images in your head. So this concept and this word of Afrovisualism is a word that I coined, it's a term that I came up with. And in this lecture, you're going to get a little more insight as to what Afrovisualism is. So, the core of what Afrovisualism is is this idea of crate digging. So, if anyone's not too familiar with the term of crate digging, crate digging is when a music artist, typically a producer, goes to a record store to find vinyls to sample for their recordings. And this idea of crate digging is you don't know where you're going to find when you're going to go into a record store. It's sort of like a treasure hunt. And this is how I approach my research. When I'm researching artists and when I'm researching about the theory, these ideas of crate digging, it's a musical analogy that relates to the research. So this, so this concept of crate digging is a colloquial term in hip hop, of course, through sample based producers. So with that, it's always kind of been a term that's been around since the inception of hip hop in the 1970s. But as it's gone along, this concept of hip hop studies came about in the 1990s. And this concept of crate dating is continual research by Adam J. Saints in his book called Digital Rios. When I found this book and I came across that phrase, that was the aha moment for me in terms of thinking about research as, as a continuum in my way of coming into it is through using music as that analogy. So continuing on this idea with music and threading these ideas, this is DJ Spooky, who is a DJ and a theorist, and he has this term called rhythm science. And with this idea of rhythm science, he has this quote where he says, DJ is writing and writing is DJ. In my practice as a curator, I do a lot of writing, and with that writing, I tend to make it visual. So I love this analogy that he makes through DJs, through the mixing of the records and keeping them in time. This is how I think about with writing. It's just not a practice where I like sit down and write. It's something that I have to sit with and, and think about when I'm coming up with and thinking about the ideas that are in a rhythm with each other. So this is me, a year ago at the ICA, um, giving an earlier version of this lecture that I'm doing now. So this practice has really progressed in the last year, and you're going to see some of the projects that I'm going to be talking about that relate these ideas about what happened in the movies and crazy. And in this realm of crazy, you know, I'm always constantly digging for artists, for theories and concepts, and this is a process that's integral to myself, but also in, in collaboration with artists that I'm working with. So it's always this collaborative process where I'm using my practice as a vehicle to guide them along in their work. 
and you can see some of those references throughout this lecture. So in my practice when I'm working with artists and to myself, this is a mantra that I have. The process is the work, and the work is the process. And the, and the reason I say this is because with the way that I create, I consider myself as an artist as well, not just a curator, but also an artist. So when I'm thinking about the process of the end goal for an artist to do is to create the work and have the work to show, but I always say that the process is the work because there's so much time and energy that goes into the research of creative work. And lots of the projects that I do are research-based projects. So the process is non-linear, it's fluid, it comes about in all sorts of different ways. So within the Afrovisions practice, if you've been following my Instagram, I talk about this idea of the black continuum. And the black continuum is really the second thread that goes along with creative digging as far as the idea of continuum is something that's always continuous and it's something that is all, always changing and evolving and shifting. So I acknowledge that change, those changes and evolutions and shifts in my work and when I'm working with artists. And there are three things that I consider when I'm thinking through this theoretical lens is that art, artistic research is an active site. So if you think about with archaeology and the concept of actually digging up artifacts, this is how I approach my research when I'm working with artists. And I consider artistic research as a field of its own. And that's what Afrovisualism as a true tutorial project is, is, is a form of artistic research. And with that, with Black Aesthetic Continual Theory, I'm theorizing as practice. So this idea of defining Black aesthetic, defining what Blackness is, not just in culture, but merging those threads through culture and art, and that knowledge production as process. So in the work, as I was saying, in, in that the process is the work, working with artists, I always say that artists are knowledge producers in that it brings the focus back to the level of time, work, and energy that artists put into their work. And it's all part of the conversations and dialogue that I have with artists. So as I said, Black said continual theory considers black artists as knowledge producers on both an individual and collaborative level. So in, in the upcoming slides, you can see some of the projects that I've done in, in the last year that show the work I've done as an individual, as Afro-Religious, and also in collaboration with other artists. So to, so to give you more of a scope of what this practice is, so at, at, as I said, that Afro-Religious is my brand, it's my platform, but a way to make it visual for you all is that Afrovisualism on two ends on two ends of the spectrum is a curatorial platform where I give artists the platform to talk about their practice. And on the other side of that is that Afrovisualism is a continual studio practice. So I describe what the continuum is. So I believe that with an artist, of course an artist has to have a studio. But I always keep the idea and the concept of an artist studio open-minded, and I think about the studio as an archive, and an archive of the mind. So I think that this idea of the studio doesn't have to be limited to a physical location, but it would be great at some point in time to actually have a physical studio to produce this work, that is a role mind. But the way I think about this concept of the studio is like how when art when artists particularly producers and rappers singers are in the studio working like that's how I get into the headspace of the creative research that we would have with visualism and and then compare that vibe and energy of, of a studio to and to a visual artist studio where they have paintings or artworks or books scattered all over the room or, or on shelves, 
I didn't think about the studio in an open-ended way where I can imagine all of these things. And towards the middle is acknowledging that as I'm an artist and a curator, and a curator and an artist, for me these things are one in the same. So as, as I mentioned before, using the analogy of creating, digging, looking for samples, Afrovisualism is a sample-based artistic practice. So in the way that producers are on the hunt for samples, I'm on the hunt for learning more about artists, learning more about timelines, movements, theories. And then, of course, as I described, the credit digging is the continuum that threads all of these things together. And that, and that Afrovisualism is the self-driven preferential so it all comes back to me and, and bringing back to design as a continuum. I'm centering the curatorial research, the theory of what I do what other, and what others do, and in the actual writing of my work. I'm centering all of these practices together as, as one whole. So continue this un unimaginable of connecting the dots. So, I, as I said, I consider these titles one and the same, an artist and a curator, as well as a curator as an artist, I'm a writer and a researcher, researcher and a writer, I'm a designer and a theorist and a theorist and a designer. So when I think when I think about how artists present themselves, of course you have to people have to know what you're doing, what you're about. And I consider these as jumping off points to the ideas that I consider myself as. And with that, this idea of dot connecting continues more through what I call myself and what I choose to call myself. So you'll see in the following slide that with design as a continuum in the way I bring it after visualism, I think about this idea of branding is something that artists don't really like to brand themselves. So the way that I approach that is not focusing on branding, the idea of stamping, because of course you know, you know where the language of branding comes from. So the way that I move this idea of branding in a different direction is that I affirm the things that I call myself. So I am the Afrovision. I'm the founding curator of Afrovisualism is the Afrovisualist practice. I am the originator of the Black Aesthetic Continuum Theory. So me calling myself as an originator of this theory, even though I don't consider myself as an academic, but I do have a theoretical perspective that threads throughout the work. So as the originator of this concept of thought, this me putting my lens on how to frame myself as a theorist and a thought leader in the work that I'm creating. And of course, I've talked about creative digging, calling myself a creative digger, the documenter, as I described. Also, I consider myself as a curatorial wordsmith, so bringing back the analogy of hip hop. So, with words, with rhyming, with, with speaking, with designing, I'm considering all of these words and ideas in conversation together. And as I talk about these theories, I consider myself, you know, as, as a theoretical mixed master. So in this time, so continuing the concept of the DJ, the creativity, the producer, all these things make up who I am and what I do. And when I'm working on projects with artists, my favorite part about the process of working with artists and coming up with their visual images is coming up with, with pitch decks and random decks, and I always have the master behind the decks. So with DJ, the turntables are also referred to as decks, so I like keep keeping the un analogy open of these concepts. And then lastly, I consider myself as a brio, because of course a brio is a West African storyteller, and I consider myself you know, as you know, the knowledge producer of this practice that feels very much like a periodic methodology where a lot of this information is in my head and I have to find ways to put that research onto the paper and onto the screen. So 
which really these ideas of nuance and it's a lot of conceptual ideas and I'm bringing them together, put in context to the work of timelines and chronologies. So getting into some of the work that is on my Instagram as far as how I approach these dot connecting ideas, idea of a visual breakdown of Beyonce's Blackest King, the African film that she did, she did with Disney. And one of the things that I pointed out is this tribe in West Africa called the Dogon, who are based in Mali. And with Black is King, is considered an Afrofuturist film. Afrofuturism is a movement that considers Black people thinking towards the future, but also reflecting upon the past. So with the Dogon, they had knowledge of the stars in outer space before telescopes were invented. So putting them along the continuum with Beyonce in a more pop cultural framework brings this knowledge in, in a different space. And I'm, in, and I'm interested in seeing how from pop culture to history and to make those, those connections and context come together. So as, as I continue with connecting these dots, this is an early version of this concept of the way I process these ideas called the Afrovisual Boards. I'll explain more as to what those are later. But continuing off what I was saying about pop culture and, and connecting these dots, one of the ways I do that is, is, sig is signifying specific sy symbols like Michael Jackson's glove from Motown. 25 his famous performance where he did the moonwalk and comparing that to Beyonce's glove that she that she wore during this single ladies video. So looking at pop culture as a continuum, I look at the significance of why this glove is a signifier to their artistry and how Beyonce and Michael Jackson's contemporaries continue the thread of this glove. And a little fun fact about both of these gloves, Michael Jackson's glove was designed by Bill Whitten, who is the brother of abstract artist Jack Whitten. And Beyonce's glove was originally de designed by French designer Terry Mugler. So Beyonce has French Creole ancestry. So I like you know, to, to connect those threads between the history of the objects that they wear and how that conversation is carried across pop culture and history. So this, so this is the first curatorial project that I've ever worked on. This is an exhibition by sample-based artist Johannes Farfield, um, who is based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, or in Winston Salem, North Carolina. And this exhibition is about a boy who walks into a museum and encounters this space time continuum. So bring back the ideas of the continuum. And these are just some of the artworks that he created. So he created kind of like uh, a storybook where the boy walks into the museum and then he sees things that he encounters in this exhibition. He's really thinking about a black boy in uh, America and what he encounters being born and growing up in the world that we're living in today. So, lots of the inspiration that Johannes had for the show was, was childhood memories of museums and books that he read. And with these books, he considered the aspects of, of storytelling and collage, because he is a collage artist, and you'll see some of the inspiration that he used on the slides. But before I get to those inspirations, it, this was the show. This show was at UNC North Carolina at Charlotte earlier this year, in January and February of this year and I did the curation and creative direction for his show, and he also had a film as a companion piece to the work that you see him watching in the middle there. 
and, and you see that the entire window is covered in, in, in this yellowish color. It's called Gusto Gold, and it's sort of the thread that connects all of this work together, and that when this board goes through the space time continuum, these are the images that he sees. So, Yaya in the Freedom Suit is the, the sort of the, cent the, the centerpiece of this work, and the concept of the Freedom Suit um, comes from Daishikis, specifically the Nibiru Daishikis from the 1970s. And so, how this relates to the, the story is that the little boy, Yaya, as he enters the museum and comes in contact with the space time continuum, he meets this ominous figure named Aya, who sort of guides him through this continuum. And because I, Aya is in all black, this all black cloak that he's wearing is the fruit. So considering that Daishikis are a form of protection, as my, as Yaya goes through this continuum and meets Yaya, meets Aya, Aya, the figure that he's looking at, is his protector. So here's some of the inspiration that Jahan has had for the show. So some storybooks, Gang and the Dinosaur by Sid Hoff and Ezra Jack Keats, The Snow Day. So essentially, Jahannes took it upon his own as a collage artist to sort of create his own narrative threads based on stories that he read as a kid. And what I love about this show is that I love reading books and, and, as a kid and illustration was something that I was really into in, in storytelling. So working on the show is really fun to be able to connect those threads with him. And this is just some of some more of the inspiration that he had with some of the works that he showed. So these two photos are a sunrise and a sunset in Wilmington, North Carolina, and in Dakar, Senegal, in Africa. So this is one of the ways that the continuum comes into the work because this idea of water is one of the threads, and he uses water as a form of time travel. So some of the inspirations we found in pop culture were this, this classic series called Quantum Leap, uh, the portals from Super Mario 64, and from the famous short um, from Mickey Mouse called Through the Mirror. So these were analogies of a portal and a continuum that we were using to thread the idea of how the character Yala travels through the world. So, the Afrovisualist practice considers mood boards in a design and curatorial sense, but also as a device. So, as you've seen on the past few slides, the mood boards that I showed you, including this one, is a part of how I work. And you're probably wondering, well, how do I keep track of all these different details and references from different artists? So, basically, it is a, a lot, <laughs> but what, but what I found is how graphic designers like myself use mood boards as a form of brainstorming and planning and conceptualizing the ideas in a work. And I work with the artist collaboratively to look at uh, other artists and look at the different themes in, in the work, especially in jobs to show we have a, a lot of yellow and orange had references to water and the sun, we had references to science fiction and African cosmology. So this, so this is my way of connecting those threads through different artists and through pop culture, but using the mood board as a device to talk through those ideas. So this is a, another curatorial project that I did some writing for. So black collages is a platform by um, Terry Henderson, who is a Baltimore-based curator. Her platform, Black Collages, is a platform that, talk, that talks about the legacy of Black collage artists, especially with Black collage artists, and this is her first book. 
and I wrote the prologue for her book. And I talk about the ideas of the black co collages, as she calls it, and, and the ideas of black collage being a visual fre frequency, and in, in, in that collages are a form of referencing yourself and the other influences that you see. And as I've talked about with African visualism and black aesthetic continual theory, I mentioned that blackness essentially exists in a collage state. So in these ideas that we wear our influences on, on our sleeves, literally, but in the way that the black aesthetic is created, it's an amalgamation of ideas. It's an amalgamation of life experiences. And that's how I thread ideas of collage in my own work. So this is from a conversation that I had with Terry not too long ago over the summer at the ICA. And what she was talking about during our conversation was this subconscious element that, that collage work offers and that it's this divine force, this spiritual force that guides the work and meeting lots of artists, not just collage artists. I've noticed you know, how passionate artists become when, when, when they know what it means when they get into a flow state in, in their work. And that's something that I articulate through my theory is how, art, how artists, as they're researching and developing their work, and also how curators are creating their work with them, that is a part of this flow that's happening. And it's, and it's part of these ideas of not connecting that I mentioned before that connect all these concepts together. So this is one of my more recent curatorial projects earlier in the last few months, Black Cinematic Continuum, that I curated um, right here in Richmond, Virginia, with the Africana Independent Film Festival, Andrew Williams Film Festival. So this was online curation that I did um, with artists who were from all over the world. Some of them were from New York City, some were from, Cam from Cameroon in Africa, and some were from Holland in, in the Netherlands. And and some of the ways that I try to approach my curatorial work is approaching not just artists in the U.S., but considering the importance of talking about the diaspora in my work. And on the next few slides, I have a few excerpts from the conversations I had with these artists that you can watch on my YouTube channel. So when I'm in conversation with artists, I really give them the floor to speak on whatever it is they want to talk about. And just by happenstance, it just all lines up to the events that I'm talking about. And one of the many things that I that I I should have my brilliance brought up in our conversation is that we are the mover in, in, in that we're walking inspiration. And I love that she said this because it's part of the call and response that I do when I'm working with artists and the collaboration. And that taking the mood board out of the screen more off the page and bringing the mood board back to the hands of the people. Because in the way to think about design, design can sometimes be lofty and sort of locked off in corners trying to replicate an aesthetic. So these ideas of the mood board, I consider that when I'm working with artists, as that there are also mood boards in their own right and, and acknowledges the work of their artist practices. And another conversation I had with the festival, during the festival, was with a uh, Cameroonian art, artist, Ethel Tawe. She is a film, she is an, an artist, an image maker, um, and in her work, um, I have a problem that I've also never heard about me talking about in this lecture, but what I want to highlight here is how she is an artistic and curatorial hybrid, and I find this unique about working with artists is that not every artist is like set in one way, painter, or a sculptor, or a photographer, but she acknowledges that her practice is a hybrid, that her practice is a hybrid of many things. And in the fact that she has to tune into the work that she 
create, and that's something that's very important to me in the work is that we have to be able to tune in to the work that you're creating. And you'll see that more in other conversations that I've had. So one of the last conversations I had during the Alcon Film Festival was with uh, a Holland-based artist, Tarona, and her, in her film, she talked about these spiritual experiences that she was having as she was creating the work that it was the realization of her ideas that she can stand behind and that others would resonate with them. And we were talking about this idea of the living and moving archive. So as I mentioned before about the process being the work and the time it takes to sit with the work and make it, I feel like that artists are not only their own new boards, but that each and every single one is our own archives. And get and get, and given that this idea of the archive is also an institutional concept. So just like the new boards are a design concept, I also consider the archive as also a, a space for people, not placing the value on the institution, but placing the value on the artist as the creator behind the work. So here are the Afrovisual boards that I was talking about before. So like, so like I said, crate digging, new boarding, these ideas as practice are realized through, these, through this curatorial ac exercise called the Afrovisual Boards, and it's me collaging artworks based on a theme, and I just go through the threads of like where I have seen these things. So one of the first ones that I actually integrated into my practice was about water. And I did two versions of these. So here are some examples right here. So both of these are, um, are from two different artists, but both of them are artist film makers. The one on the left is uh, by Jen McCurry, who is an artist and director um, who's actually worked with Beyonce on the Blackest King and other films. But these are her films right here, the work is necessary to black to techno, where she thinks about the archive and she thinks about water. So when I'm watching and consuming a lot of work, and a lot of what Afrovisualism is and what my time is spent, is consuming a lot of an artist's practice and sitting there. So even in the second slide here is with Arthur Jaffa. Um, he has collages and films that he's created that also deal with water, but in different ways. But I just like pointing out the connections and how artists use a motif in their work and connecting artists who might not always be in conversation directly, but bringing them in conversation to their art. So this is the most recent curatorial project that I had the pleasure of working on. This is image frequency modulation by Apple Tale, one of the artists that I mentioned earlier in this talk. This was an assemblage of a two radio channel and audio visual installation as part of her residency in Palm Heights in the Cayman Islands. So on this project, what it basically was is a radio station that she recreated based on her upbringing in Cameroon, where her dad was a radio host of African radio, and she combined these ideas of FM radio and, and, and her family history and created this project where she has radios and has prints from her home in Cameroon and brings it to the site-specific location in the Cayman Islands to connect these ideas about sound because it's radio and connect these ideas about the archive that are in these prints. And the fact that she decided to have this talk, that she decided to have this work in a library was to create a, an insulation space that people would really be able to take in the work. And on this project, I was her sonic curator so most of this project was an audio-visual project that you would sit and listen to. 
So I assisted with using the inspiration from artists like Jim McCurry and Arthur J. Flo. In black cinema, there's a lot of these ideas that use sound as a device for theory and communication. So I helped her piece to, together the interviews that she did with other artists and other people that resonated with her concept of intrusive modulation. And as a part of this project, working with her, I wrote an essay that responds to this project. And this essay is my first editorial feature on something curated, you can go read it right now. It's an Afrovisualist call and response essay on the Black Continuum. So in all the artists that I work with, I find ways to implement ideas of the Black Continuum to create this neural network and, and rise on working with the artists that I've, I've had the pleasure of being in conversation with. So as I mentioned, this idea of the Pira makes master and, and continuing those threads of artistic research as a form of creativity in this continuum and that the artist is both the listener and transmitter of the research curation and the outcome. So I'm acknowledging all of the aspects of an artist's process in the realization of a project. So I assisted Ethel on, on the curatorial research with this project, creating the decks, building the decks to create this visual language that became her project. And, and on the graphic here that you see on my Instagram, I connected with her to a curatorial project that she's developed called Listening to Images, where she was pulling images from artists that she was inspired by, and we found a common ground in that. So in that, this essay was a call and response for the both of us, and how we had similar ideas of looking at imagery and thinking about how to process that through a science lens, like how I do with crazy. She does that through entries and modulation. So with essays, I like to just not just have it as like a simple essay, but treat it as like a visual project and a visual essay that connects these threads that that I'm forming based on the work and can be connected with the artist as well. So I use the essay as an example of that vehicle that I was talking about that guides the work. And, here's, and here are the images that I actually use in, in the essay, some of them you see from the actual visual awards. And like I said, the main threads were my work, Apple's work, and putting ourselves in context with other artists in the realm of black cinema. So Jen Kiru in the middle, John Confer on the bottom left, Arthur J. Falk on the bottom right. So in particular, what all of these artists have in common is that they also theorize as they're creating their work and they apply those theories to their films. So where we found common ground on was using our Instagram platforms as a form of extending that artistic research to the public for the, pub for the public to engage with and, and then applying those, those ideas to our projects. And that's one of my favorite things about working with artists that they able to find this common ground in, in something that is very layered as research and being able to apply that to projects. That concludes my lecture. You can follow me on Instagram and check out my YouTube channel. Thank you. <laughs> Y'all have any questions for me? <laughs> I have a question. Uh, when you talk about like crate digging, what would you say is your favorite place to like dig? Would it be like museums, uh, like Google searches, or like where is your go to place that like pours the most fruit for you? YouTube. YouTube, really? Yeah. And the reason is because through these threads of research that I've created, I like being able to listen to music as, as I work. And then also I like to watch artist talks. And I'm always following different artists and watching their art, their artist talks. And a lot of them are on YouTube. So I, so I sort of thought of in the way I approach 
research, use YouTube as this archive that I can always reference and go back to. Because all, all, all a lot of the work that I've developed, I've also referenced from the artist talks that I've watched, and I sort of like keep a track through the different talks that I enjoy the most from artists and use those as, as a guide as I listen to how they process their work and and, and apply those to. And, and her work is also 
develop like in the in, in the music industry too, but also in the art world. So I have realized that with the commentary that I do, that it does talk about a lot of like pop cultural figures and it talks about a lot of figures in the visual arts. So I try to combine those together and her work is really an, an, an example of that. And I even had a chance to meet her when she came to the ICA a few years ago and it was very affirming that I was on the right track. Do you work at the ICA? No, I, 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 I don't. I just go there from time to time. <laughs> Any more questions? Did you ever work with Art No, I haven't worked with them yet, but I am. Familiar. Do you have interest in working with kids in middle school, high school? <laughs> 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 direction of like the, the continuum and like where do you see as like the start of it would you say it's like because when I was looking at all the images and stuff I kept thinking about how things have been like reiterated so many times like brought into new forms and just thinking about like you know where what was the the source do you feel of that energy and getting like as far back as you've gone for research you know is that like the useful question <laughs> 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 No, yeah, like, I feel like for me, because I always still love reading, like, especially growing up in, uh, in, in middle school, especially, I would always go for the nonfiction section and read the coffee table books. And I, I love being able to, like, read through, like, all of, like, the footnotes and the anecdotes of how something was put together. Like, I still love reading, uh, like, the, DK or like the Time of Life magazine books that had a lot of historical information and 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 I really like history and through my work I approach my love for history through research and even through some of my work too and getting a chance to get to know people and talk to people and, and one of the artists that's here today is Trey Seals of Vocal Type. Um, get a chance to, to get to know him because he's also a designer and, and being that you know, we're, we're both really into research so so when what the core of it is for me a love for research and connecting those threads but in terms of like where I want to like take it I see myself as Afrovisualism creating work as Afrovisualism with my theories and my my writing and concepts and creating exhibitions as myself, but then all also curating for artists all, also as Afrovisualism in in the way that we've seen in my life. Any other Thank you. 